In this video, we're going to talk about force versus time graphs and what the area of these represents. So sketch for yourself a net force versus time graph, uh, and then let's just use a straight horizontal line to illustrate our point. Uh, now the area of the graph is going to be represented by the some height, which in this case would be whatever the value of the net force is, sigma f, uh, and then whatever range of time that we want to look like. So this would be delta t. So we multiply the height of the net force times delta t. Okay, so if I was to shade in this area of the graph, then I know that whatever this box represents, it's going to give me net force times time, which oh, that's what we call the impulse. Um, the impulse is one letter that we use to represent it, j. The net force is a vector and the impulse is a vector. And of course, we can relate the net force or the impulse to momentum um, and say that uh, the net force times time or the impulse is equal to a change of momentum. So anytime you look at the area of a force versus time graph, you are looking at the change in momentum of an object. And we can use that to solve uh, different things about the mass and velocity of the object whose force is being graphed. Let's do an example problem. The net force acting on a toy rocket is graphed with time below. What is the change in momentum from 0 to 12 seconds? Okay, so let's start there. Um, also, quick, notice that the net force right here, it just says F. Um, occasionally, you'll find that on equation sheets and things like that, they will stop calling this the net force. They might just use F, and it's implied that it's the net force. Um, we're going we're gonna to use that when we talk about integrals. For right now, let's just call this the net force because um, it's easier for our notations. But we'll change back to just using F in a second. Okay, so what is the change in momentum from 0 to 12 seconds? Well, that's asking me to look at all of this area. Okay, so if I can figure out what all of that area represents, then I can say what the change in momentum is. Now, there are a few ways that you can do this. One is that you can break this up into distinct shapes and use the area equations for those shapes, so rectangles, triangles, that kind of thing. I find that if you have if you have grid marks like this, it's nice to just define what one box is equal to and then try and count as many boxes as you can. Okay, so one box. One box on this graph is going to have a height of 20 newtons and a base of one second. So each box represents 20 newton seconds, which is good because newton seconds are the units of impulse. Oh my god, how do I spell impulse? Impulse, there we go. So each box represents 20 newton seconds of impulse, or change of momentum. So now let's count the boxes. You'll notice that we have some positive boxes above the x-axis and some negative boxes below. So we need to keep track of which ones are positive and which ones are negative. Let's start with this positive area here. I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and then it looks like these two would give me uh, 19, and then these would give me about 3. Um, if you want, you can instead think you've got 12 boxes here, and then this is half of 12 boxes because it's a triangle, so that's 6. Uh, and this section right here would be half of 8 boxes, so 4. Either way, you're going to get about um, 22 boxes. Okay, so 22 boxes, how much does 22 and their positive boxes represent? Well, each box is 20 newton seconds, so I just multiply 22 by 20, and that gives me 440 newton seconds of impulse. So that top area is a positive 440 newton seconds of impulse. Um, and if I want to write this, the change of momentum equals, we can say I've got that positive 440 newton seconds, and now I have to deal with, from 8 to 12 seconds, this negative area right here. So for that negative area, again, you can count boxes or just kind of take a look at the shapes. Like here I have eight boxes, and this is half of eight, so four. So this is going to be in all 12 boxes, and 12 boxes times 20 newton seconds is going to give me 240. But they're below, so negative 
240 uh, newton seconds. Okay, so I take this top part, the 440, then subtract this bottom part, so minus 240, and I found that the change in momentum is 200 newton seconds, and that's a positive 200 newton seconds, which is important. There we go. We looked at the area and we found the change in momentum from 0 to 12 seconds. Okay, now a fun question to mix it up. When is the rocket in equilibrium? Okay, well, so you might think that because we're dealing with areas of the graph that, that this is asking you to take a look at the slope, right, the, the derivative. But since this is a graph of force versus time, and equilibrium means when is the force zero, the net force zero, then it's not asking you for to look for slopes of zero. It is literally just asking you to figure out when do you have a value of zero on your graph. And you have that at two points. In the beginning, at zero seconds, and here at eight seconds. So you would say negative, I'm sorry, you would say the net force is zero at zero seconds and eight seconds, but only at those moments. All right, C. The rocket is two kilograms and has an initial velocity of four meters per second. What is the velocity of the rocket after 12 seconds? Okay, so what are they telling us here? They're telling us that the mass is two kilograms. They're telling us the initial velocity is four meters a second. And there is an amount of time, 12 seconds. Oh, well, so the 12 seconds is saying, okay, you found the change in momentum from zero to 12 seconds. You know that that's 200 newtons. Maybe I'll write that down here as a given piece of information. Use that to calculate the final velocity. Okay, well, the change of momentum, delta P, is really, you know, the momentum in the beginning minus the momentum at the end. I can write that m delta V or mv minus mv naught. And I know delta P, I know m and v naught, uh, and I want to find v. So what do I do? I'm going to rearrange this equation. So I would first add mv naught to both sides. So delta P plus mv naught, let's do this to give us some space, uh, is equal to mv. Then I'm going to divide both sides by m to get the velocity by itself. And now I can plug in my numbers. So the velocity is the change of momentum 200 newton seconds plus 2 kilograms times 4, so 8 meters a second, all over 2 kilograms. Now this is going to give me the final velocity since I know the change in momentum was 200 newton seconds. The initial velocity is 4 and the mass is 2 kilograms. Okay, um, so 200 plus 8 is 208. Uh, divided by 2 is 104, which is incredibly fast. So this toy rocket is flying, uh, quite literally, with a velocity of 104 uh, meters per second uh, after that initial 12 seconds. I, I maybe made this problem up with numbers that were too high. That's a, that's a good velocity. That's like, that's like almost a football field in a second. I guess that that's, could happen. Okay. Uh, so now let's do um, a, a problem where we're looking at, or we're not, sorry, let's not do a problem. Now let's talk about uh, generally what can we do now that we know the area of a force versus time graph tells us change in momentum or impulse. What does that mean for us with the integral? Well, let's talk about that impulse as an integral. If you make a graph of net force versus time, and again, let's, here's where we're going to stop calling this sigma f and let's call it f just because it's more common to express the equation this way. So let's say that you um, have some graph and it doesn't have straight lines. It has curving lines because it's some sort of curving function. Well, now you could approximate the area um, by just kind of looking at how much area it is and counting boxes. But it's better if you can use whatever the function is. So they'll give you some function of time, maybe like 2t plus 3 or something like that. Uh, and you can find the area with integration, or the antiderivative. So remember, here's how we I express the integral, which tells us the area. We think of the area of a line on our graph. Okay, so the area of a line is kind of weird. It'll have a height of whatever the function is. Okay, so height of whatever the function is times the width, but the width we use dt because the width of this line is so small that it's 
infinitesimal. So we use infinitesimal, uh, dt, that's an infinitesimal, uh, as our width. And then what we do is we take the area of this infinitely thin line, and then we begin to add it up so that we get many infinitely thin lines adding together to give us a definite area under the graph. Now, when we do this infinitely, uh, we use summa to say that we are infinitely adding together those lines because summa is the symbol for infinite sum. It's like sigma. Um, and when we are finding this area, we are finding the change of momentum or the impulse, j. Okay, great. Now, this is our equation. This is the antiderivative. Normally, there's going to be like a plus c, or in this case, you would say that it's the momentum um, in the beginning, like that. That's, of course, if you're doing an indefinite integral. So, like, an example would be if f was 3t and you needed to find j indefinitely, then you would say uh, the antiderivative of 3t with respect to dt which gives you t squared uh, 3 over 2. And instead of saying plus c, you could say plus c if you want. It's more common to think, oh, well, that c is actually the whatever the momentum is in the beginning, the initial momentum. Okay, so that's how you can do it indefinitely. Um, another thing is to, I'm sorry, the impulse in the beginning. Another thing that's more common for this type of integral is to express it uh, definitely. And if you express it definitely, then what that means is you pick some time, like t1, that you want to start at, and then you integrate 2 a second time, t2. So if you're doing it definitely, then you would put your integral, uh, sorry, your integrand t1 on the bottom and t2 to say where you want to integrate from to. So this is the equation for finding the change of momentum or the impulse by anti-deriving a force equation. Now, luckily, this equation is normally given to you on most tests. Like on the AP physics test, this is an equation that is given to you. Uh, it won't have the t1 and the t2, but it's kind of implied that that's what you're supposed to do. And of course, you will know to do that because you are so amazing and smart. So let's do some examples with this so that you can get an idea of what it looks like in practice. A roller coaster car is accelerated from rest with electromagnets following the equation F equals dt squared plus et plus 2n, where d is 3 newtons per second squared and e is negative 0.5 newton seconds. What is the change in momentum from 0 to 3 seconds? And what is your velocity after 3 seconds if you have a mass of 70 kilograms? Okay, so let's start with part A. Since this is using numbers and asking me to uh, find numbers, I'm probably going to take my force equation and write it in a bit more math-friendly way, which means I just plug in the, the coefficients um, or, or the constants. So I would write f equals dt squared, uh, or 3t squared, plus et, or sorry, minus 0.5t and what else we got? Ah, yeah, the plus 2n. Plus 2. So that's a math-friendly way of writing it. Of course, if you want, if you don't like using decimals, you could say t over 2, or 1 half t. It doesn't matter. Okay, so what do we do? How do I find the change in momentum from 0 to 3 seconds? Well, this is a definite integral, um, and the change of momentum is the impulse. So you can say that you're finding j if you want, or you can say that you're finding delta p. It really doesn't matter. I'm going to write delta p. Uh, and then I integrate the force equation. So 3t squared minus t over 2 plus 2 with respect to t. And I'm going to do that from 0 to 3 seconds. Okay, so this is going to give me t cubed, 3 over 3, so 1, minus t squared, um, 1 half over 2, so We'll simplify all this later. Uh, and then the 2 becomes 2t. And of course, I have to evaluate from 0 to 3. So let me simplify this. t squared over 4, that term. And then 3 over 3 is just 1. OK, so to evaluate this, I plug in 3 for t, get a number. Then I plug in 0 for t, get a number, and, and find the difference. Thankfully, 0 really simplifies it. This is just going to be um, 3 q 
cubed minus 3 squared over 4 plus 2 times 3 and then minus you're just going to get a big fat 0 so 3 cubed minus 3 squared over 4 plus 2 times 3 is 30 and 3 fourths or 30.75 um, so you could say newton seconds or kilogram meters per second remember those are the same thing uh, for the, the change of momentum. Now if you want to verify this or just to get there quickly uh, in your work then remember you can graph the original function so not t cubed minus 2 over 4 plus 2t instead you're going to graph 3t squared which I'll use x for this 3x squared minus x divided by 2 um, plus 2. So you can graph the original function and then use second trace or the calc features Oh my goodness, second calc, uh, and go to number 7, which will integrate. The lower limit you would say is 0, the upper limit is 3, and boom, we just confirmed a change of momentum from 30, uh, sorry, of 30.75. Great. So, what does that mean for part B? What is our velocity after 3 seconds if you have a mass of 70 kilograms? Well, the same thing that we were doing before, the change of momentum is mv minus mv naught. And in this particular problem, it tells you here um, that you accelerate from rest. So that tells you your initial velocity is zero. And you can get rid of this term. So the velocity is really just going to be um, that change of momentum divided by the mass. So the velocity is the change of momentum, 30.75 kilogram meters per second, divided by a mass of 70 kilograms. 0.75 divided by 70, which gives you a really small number, 0 0.439, 0 0.44, we'll say, meters per second. So this is not very fast, and I probably should have made D a lot bigger uh, to give you a quicker acceleration, but it's all right. Anyway, that's how you use the impulse momentum uh, as, an, as an integral to figure out change of momentum. You take the force function and you anti-derive it. Pretty straightforward and pretty easy. You uh, are really smart and this video is really done. <laughs>